Bankole, Director, Enterprise Development Center. Peter Bankole pioneered the Enterprise Development Center, EDC, of the Pan-Atlantic University in January 2003, now one of the top enterprise development centers in Africa. As the director of the center, he is responsible for the overall program development, capacity building, and support services to entrepreneurs and students across the university. Trained as a mechanical engineer in the UK, with MBA from IESE Business School in Spain and alumnus of Lagos Business School, Chief Executive Program, he led the Goldman Sachs 10,000 Women Initiative in Nigeria and was a consultant to the project in Liberia. He initiated and led several partnership programs with diverse stakeholders such as the British Council, World Bank, International Finance Corporation and many others to mention a few. Peter consults widely in Sub-Saharan Africa on entrepreneurship, development and practice. He currently chairs the Board of Nigeria Climate Innovation Center, International Breweries Foundation, and a member of the Lagos State Research and Innovation Council, amongst others. He is a member of the Pan-Atlantic University Management Council and served on the Youth Learning Advisory Committee of the MasterCard Foundation. Ladies and gentlemen, Peter Bamkoli. Oh, Mr. Bankole. Peter Bankole, Director, Enterprise Development Center. Peter Bankole pioneered the Enterprise Development Center, EDC, of the Pan-Atlantic University in January 2003, now one of the top enterprise development centers in Africa. As the director of the center, he is responsible for the overall program development, capacity building, and support services to entrepreneurs and students across the university. Trained as a mechanical engineer in the UK with MBA from IESE Business School in Spain and alumnus of Lagos Business School, Chief Executive Program. He led the Goldman Sachs 10,000 Women Initiative in Nigeria and was a consultant to the project in Liberia. He initiated and led several partnership programs with diverse stakeholders such as the British Council, World Bank, International Finance Corporation and many others to mention a few. Peter consults widely in Sub-Saharan Africa on entrepreneurship, development and practice. He currently chairs the Board of Nigeria Climate Innovation Center, International Breweries Foundation and a member of the Lagos State Research and Innovation Council, amongst others. He is a member of the Pan-Atlantic University Management Council and served on the Youth Learning Advisory Committee of the MasterCard Foundation. Ladies and gentlemen, Peter Bamkoli. On behalf of everyone, it gives me great pleasure to welcome um, Mr. Peter Bankole, I mean, I've learned from you. If you've ever been to EDC, you will know him. And he's going to be leading the discussion for our plenary session on closing the funding gap, key perspectives on attracting foreign investment. Um, we can't wait to hear from you and um, jump right into the panel. 10 minutes on the clock, and we'll move to the panel discussion. Over to you, sir. Thank you so much, uh, Isabella. Um, I'm just going to start by sharing my screen. It's a very tall order, I must say, following TD anytime. Uh, so you will you will pardon me if I'm not able to live up to TD standard. Um, he's, he's, a, he's a senior colleague in this particular area. But thank you so much for having me and um, it's always a pleasure to talk about things that you believe in. Today, we're going to be talking about uh, closing the, the funding gap, key perspectives on attracting foreign investment. Now, for me, I'm just going to share, based on what I have learned, what I have experienced in the last 20 years or so working in this space. Um, so it's going to be more from the practice point of view. 
rather than um, anything else. I want to start by um, just warming up our minds as to what has happened in the last quarter. Uh, if you look at Nigerian startups uh, in, in Q3, uh, they raised close to a quarter of a billion dollars uh, in funding, just in one quarter. And that's, that's uh, almost double what was raised in Q2 of this year. And if you look at this, uh, this chart, you will see, and, and rightly so, that the financial services sector uh, is actually, uh, you know, gaining a, a bigger foothold in, in attracting funding. Um, this this deals is about uh, 29 deals, and um, that that's for, for Q3. So hopefully it gets better every quarter. But attracting foreign investment requires positioning, uh, from my perspective, at three levels. Uh, and, and so money just don't come. The investment just don't come. Uh, we need to position ourselves to be able to attract those investments. So these three levels, uh, the first is what we call the country level uh, positioning. Uh, and, and this is very critical because investors see countries differently but like they say, dollar only go where the investment is right. And so a country have, must be intentional, they must be deliberate about attracting uh, you know, investment to their country. Uh, typically, you will have some kind of government agency that is focused heavily on this. This is a investment promotion council, for instance, and, and in Nigeria, we do have one. But beyond that, every activity of government, whether it's, um, it's been done through the presidency, whether it's been done through um, at the ministerial level, whichever way it is, anybody that has the capacity to speak on behalf of the country must be speaking in sync and be making everybody else feel comfortable. Now, also at the country level, you have to look at the laws governing investment. Uh, you have to look at um, uh, all kind of framework that helps people who invest in your country to be able to repatriate their dividends and things like that, or, or move their money when it is required. If investors are not comfortable at the framework that governs a country, bringing investment in the country, they will not come. And so different countries position themselves to be able to attract at that level. But that's one aspect of it. Then you go to the state level. Uh, yes, the country can be doing something and it may be very nice, but at state level, they will also compete for investment coming into their state. And I'd like to use Lagos State as an example. I think in last year, for instance, Lagos was actually voted as the capital, as the startup capital for, for uh, Africa um, ahead of, of, of Nairobi. Now, what does that mean? The minute you are at that level, everybody begins to look at you. It means that you become like a beautiful bride and everything you do, People look at it. And this is not something that just happened. Again, states are very intentional about this. And I'll give you a couple of examples. People talk about um, tech companies springing up in Lagos and things are happening, but it didn't happen overnight. People talk about um, the Yaba axis. It didn't happen overnight. Right of way had to be given by Lagos state along that axis to make sure that internet connect connectivity was easy and a lot of you know, startups move around that place, coupled with the fact that you have uh, design institutions around that space. Of course, then you have the likes of CC Hub and the rest coming to that space. So an ecosystem developed around that, that was intentional. It wasn't a happenstance. 
And so state, look at what is happening with last week. Um, that's also very intentional. And when you begin to create some kind of um, catalyst funds for small businesses, sorry, it is state, not, uh, yeah, it's just a simple mistake. So that, that gives a very interesting positioning of the state. And then the last one is community. Beyond the state, there are specific communities that develop and they're able to focus very well on uh, attracting people. So when um, Mark Zuckerberg came, for instance, now he had to go to that uh, community in Yaba. Um, whatever is happening, you are looking for something, you know where to go. Community must be developed. And that community will have like a value chain from uh, pre-startup to startup to fairly established ones. And they work together to be able to help each other to develop capacity. Again, these are intentional and you have to look at it from this uh, three dimension, okay? Now, but before positioning, let, let's talk about first thing first. And, and this is very, very important. Uh, even if we have done all of that, and I, and I hear uh, TD talk about value extensively, if we do not deliver value locally, nobody's gonna look at you. And so no matter how thriving our ecosystem is, no matter how attractive our country or state may be, it is important for us that we provide value. Once we provide value, the next thing is get onto the ring and compete. Now, what that does for you is that you test your guts, you test your business model, you test everything. In fact, there is some unwritten saying today amongst the investment community, and they'll tell you, if, if you've not tried and tested it out in Lagos, uh, no, go and do it there, then you come back to us. Because that's where the action is. If you can succeed in Lagos, you, the chances of you being successful everywhere else is very high. And so that's a bonus for Lagos, for instance, because it becomes a solid uh, ring where people actually you know, slug it out. Uh, beyond that, there are many, many hackathons, competitions, all that. All of these help you not only to uh, test your business model, but also to refine some aspect of it so that you can compete even better. Having said that, you need to build networks. You build, build networks locally and internationally. All of these help you. Because if you are not seen, honestly speaking, nobody can get invest in you. People must know what you are doing. So it's important for you to be relevant at home. And then within that, your ecosystem, please, please, please be active. Now, all of these are absolutely important. Without this, sincerely, forget about any uh, attracting any foreign investment. I always advise people to start with local investors. Um, yes, it is possible that you can get investment straight away, but it's almost difficult, very difficult to get investment, international or uh, foreign investment without having local investors. You must believe in yourself. People, your people must believe in you and invest in you first before others from outside will do the same. Check out all the ones that, uh, you know, have really had external investment, whether it's Flutterwave, whether it's Max NG, and so on and so forth. All of them started by having local investors. And then the local investors help them, whether it is uh, in refining their business model uh, in the area of governance, whatever it is, it stabilizes them and then they can begin to take them on, on Series A, Series B, and so on and so forth. Now, there are many early stage investors. My advice is usually to start with those people because they understand the terrain. 
things that you will not think about. They already, they've gone through it. So for them, it's just a process. And once they can help you and hold you, walk you through uh, that process, you become uh, a lot more ready uh, for foreign investment. Um, of course, like I said, uh, it's an avenue for you to try and test your business model. Um, and they also get you to a point where you have sustainable revenue. This is very critical. Honestly speaking, nobody's going to throw money at you anyhow. They want to be sure that, yes, I mean, they will wait. Uh, it's, it's what we call the patient capital, but even patient capital is not stupid. And so, yes, I know that it might take a while, but I know ultimately that I would not only get my capital back, but I would also get uh, you know, decent return. And that's why we're doing it. So it's very important uh, that all of these, the, the early stage investors, the local investors, they help you to get to that point. One critical point that they also will help you with is governance. Uh, nobody's going to invest in you without serious governance structure in place. And, and TD, I'm, I'm happy that you mentioned that uh, in, your, in your presentation. In all of this, what it does is that it increases your visibility uh, and then people will be able to, to actually market you. Sorry. But we must understand that um, foreign investors differ. Um, their requirements are not the same. There are some that are focused on social impact, some are gender biased. Uh, more recently, we are, we're seeing a few that are focused on secularity. Uh, some are even sector specific, whether it is clean energy, fintech, health, agritech, whatever it is. It means that not every foreign investor is going to invest in you. You need to study them, you need to understand them, and you need to be sure that they are interested in what you do. That's when you begin to position and focus yourself on it. Whatever the case, there are four things that we must know. The first is that there has to be a value alignment. No matter how good that foreign investment investor is, if there is no alignment of value, please don't even think about it. Whatever you also do, I'm not sure any foreign investor will, will even look at you if they don't see a um, scaling pathway. It's almost impossible because they're not just coming there for, for the fun of it. They want to be able to take what you are doing here, maybe in Nigeria, and then scale it across Africa. They want to be able to do what you are doing here and then scale it across um, similar economies, maybe developing economies or whatever. So scale is, is always a critical point uh, when you're looking at uh, international or foreign investment. But in all of these, you got to be prepared. You know, people speak when they have the opportunity to speak to these uh, foreign investors. <laughs> they just flop. You need to understand your market analysis. You need to do your research, your data. Everything must be, must be at your fingertips. That's when they know that you are on top of the market. You know where you are going you, and they can rely on you. The business plan is always good, but guess what? The person that drives that business plan, like most of this will tell you, that is even a bigger consideration. Having done all of this, you know, it's good. People just don't invest because the business is good. Sometimes they invest because they know that this person um, can be, is dependable. Uh, this person, they've, they've related with this person over the last few years and they can trust this person or the way, you know, so building some kind of international network and relationship uh, does have, add significant value uh, in your ability to be able to uh, attract foreign investments. Now, it's also important for you to look at these foreign investors and say which of them are either Africa or Nigerian focused. Because the reality is that if they are not, then there's no point in talking to them. Some are focused on Asia, 
some on Latin America and so on and so forth. So there's no point in you speaking to those ones if Nigeria or Africa is not their priority. Also, there are some that are interested in development or what we call the proper issues, then you may be able to qualify depending on what you are doing. Some are basically impact driven and it doesn't matter where in the world you are. Some, it could just be about your sectoria, um, your sector. So you need to understand this very, very well rather than just casting the net. No, it has to be extremely focused. I totally agree. Um, really understanding the market you're playing. I think you just piggyback off what um, Mr. Davis said about that local context. And I'm sure we'll get more into the conversation. I'm, I'm about finishing. Um, I'm about finishing. We, 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 we have to move swiftly. I've added oh, okay, more time okay. than necessary. Okay, sorry, I'm sorry. I think, okay. I think what okay. we can do is, um, as the time permits and the conversation starts, you can tease in some of those answers from okay. your presentation. And I mean, the feedback, if you look at the chat, has been amazing. Um, definitely a lot of um, wisdom you've been dropping. Um, thank you very much. I'd quickly like to bring in um, the other plenary discussants. Um, we have Mr. Babajide, um, sorry, we have Babajide Ibironke. Chief Finance Officer, Viathan. We also have Oluwa Toyin Adegutemo, Executive Director, West Africa, African Venture Philanthropy Alliance. We have Dr. Rabiu Onoalakbo Olowo, Honorable Commissioner for Finance, Lagos State Government. We have Yemi Kerry, CEO of Heka Bella. We have Maya Horgan Famodu, Founder, Ingressive Capital. Titi Ovia, Co-Founder, Head of Growth, Helium Health, and our moderator, he's um, on standby. He's not able to join us due to um, some internet connectivity, uh, Mr. Wale Anifooshe, who is the General Manager, Programs and Partnerships, Enterprise Development Center. But like I said, he's um, on standby. I'll be filling in for him as the moderator of this panel. And I want to welcome every single one of you. Um, I see Mr. Anifooshe is actually here. So that's great. Yes, um, I'm here. It's Abella. Internet connectivity yes. is working. So yes, over yes. to you, uh, Mr. Thank Nikoshi. you very much. Technology is powerful. Uh, really, thank really you very wonderful. much. So okay. um, the timer starts now and I'll be uh, messaging you the moderator to keep to time. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, Isabella. Uh, and thank you very much to everyone here. It's really good to be here. Um, I was really enjoying my Oga's uh, uh, conversation. I think he was setting a very interesting uh, tone for this uh, panel discussion. So I think I'm going to actually start from there because uh, uh, Banky, I actually wanted you to finish um, the to wrap up that conversation you were having. You had talked about the three level positioning, and and I think that it's important that one of the things that uh, the, the the participants here today get the feel of is despite all of this positioning that could be happening at country level, state level, or within the community, as the case may be, there are still several um, startups that don't get that opportunity. What are some of those things that we can do or can start to happen at any of those levels to start to bridge uh, that gap, which uh, many startups have when it comes to accessing funding? Okay, thank you, uh, Wale. I, I was just going through the charts and, and I saw something that's actually very interesting. Um, a number of startups actually are not either aware of this community that we're talking about. They're not aware of those that are, you know, I mean, if I did not know Yemi Kerry, for instance, I probably will not know about rising, rising Tide. But they have been heavily focused on working with women and investing in early stage you know, uh, women businesses. But so we need to do something about it relating between government, that is Lagos state government, and working with this community of people and making sure that as many startups as possible are aware of these people. I think that, that's an eye opener for me and I'm very happy that somebody put that in the chat. Thank you very much, uh, Banky, for for doing for mentioning that. I think it's actually quite important that um, even startups themselves have that responsibility to be looking 
uh, for the funding opportunities that are out there. Uh, one other thing which you mentioned was uh, that startups should start with the local investor. So my, my next question is actually to uh, Mr. Babajide Bironke, um, who is um, the CFO of Vetian. Of course, you are providing you know, funding opportunities to startups locally. What would you say that startups should do to prepare themselves to even start to access uh, investment locally? Thank you very much and good morning, everyone. Thank you for, for having me on this, on this program. Um, well, just like Bankole said earlier on, I think when TD made his presentation, he just went straight ahead into everything that everybody has to say. And Mr. Bankole as well had, you know, look just like he, some of the other points that one would have loved to say. So it's pretty much difficult for some of us to come out to do very, very excellent speakers who have experience on this topic area. But fundamentally, the, the first, what I would like to mention is that the fundamental requirement for most of these startups is to find a way to direct their business. So you need to mitigate or eliminate some major, even minor risk. For instance, some investors don't like key man risk. So you've got to put in place measures that will enable anyone to see clearly that you have proper structures and processes in place. Uh, you, it, it might not be very expensive. It might be something as simple as ensuring that all transactions are banned or some records are kept in some ways. Uh, TD has also spoken to the need for you to have a proper governance structure in place, like having a board, people with character, what is their quality, you know, be committed to the ethos and principles of corporate governance, like transparency, openness, probity, accountability, integrity, fairness, all of those things are very, very important to investors. They want to look at it. There are quite a number of other things you may need to watch out for. Some investor may not look at your business, you know, because if its location is prone to some uncontrollable risks like insecurity and all of that. And that's why I love the way Mr. Bankoli has put it at country level, state level, and community level. You definitely don't want to put your investment in a very volatile area where you're not even sure what's going to happen in those areas when you put it. And all of this, this speak to the risks that I mentioned earlier on. Of course, you cannot under, overemphasize the need for you to understand your market, have an impeccable knowledge of your product. You need to show some historical trend. And most of the major problems that I've seen in startups in Nigeria is that they practically run the business on the top of their heads. They've forgotten that people need to see some sort of numbers. And as an accountant, the accountant in me is saying, why don't you just put some bookkeeping system in place to demonstrate that you have some historical discipline, financial discipline that shows people that you can distinguish between your money and the business money. So that entity concept, the business entity concept, you need to demonstrate clearly that you understand it and you understand the middle or what I call the typology of company funding. All right, so you need to target the right kind of investor class. All companies do need some form of capital, I, I get it. But again, you need to target the right investors class. There are different classes of investors. Some do have appetite to start up, some don't. Some investors have you know, particular interest in some, some industry, uh, as you have earlier, earlier on mentioned as well. So all of these things are very, very, very important. In fact, some, import, some investors like asset-driven businesses. Some don't want to carry any assets in their books. So all of these factors have to be considered uh, by startups and put into and be deliberate about ensuring that they have they have proper they, they, they can show and demonstrate that they are actually looking at these things critically. One more point before I stop, I've seen some startups making revenue of as high as five hundred million in a year, but cannot spend five hundred thousand naira to to keep a proper book and get it audited <laughs> by some several to ten. 10 other auditors that are part from the big four auditors that we have. If you look at 500,000 Naira, it is about 0.01% of a 500 million Naira. So why don't you spend the 500K to keep a proper book and put it in a place where people can understand that is some set of accountability and you are also responsible as an organization to be able to present an audited account as opposed to just having all your data scattered all around. So you need to look into getting you may not be able to afford the big four. And most of the time, they are quite affordable if you speak to them on the value proposition and what you have to do. 
but you can't have a revenue of 500 million and shy away from incurring 500,000 naira to audit your financial statement. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Ibiro. Okay, you brought in some very interesting perspective to this conversation. And one key one which you mentioned is ensuring that these startups have some governance, some structure in their business, because this makes them even more valuable and attractive to investors. And this is a good time to bring in uh, Madam Yemi Kerry to talk about um, what are some of the suggestions that you would be giving to these startups so that they are not just focusing on having innovative disruptions, but how do they ensure that there's sustainability and they can demonstrate same to investors? Um, thanks, Wale, and uh, good morning, everybody. Um, it is very important that you look at sustainability when you are looking at development of your product or your service. You know, um, for a lot of investors, sustainability is one of the major things that they watch out for. I mean, greatest impact solutions to the greater society is, is what guides a lot of, of, um, of investors and, and their decisions. So when a startup is looking at, at how they're going to impact, they, they need to look at what every sector is run on now, which is most importantly technology. Technology allows for flexibility. Um, if your revenue model you're starting with is based on um, a particular uh, uh, deliverable and you find out that along the way you have to change that particular revenue model, the easiest uh, catalyst of that is technology. When you're looking at sustainability in the long run, where you have to you know, roll back or roll forward, the, the best catalyst for that is, 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 is technology. When you're looking at scalability, which um, is a major, a major thing in terms of value proposition, um, your ability for your product or your service to scale, um, and it, it is a major thing that investors also look for. And mm. what can allow you easily do that is technology. So it is important to use technology in whatever sector um, you are in as a founder, in whatever business you are in, it's, it is important to leverage on technology. Um, that's, that also allows for measurement and monitoring of the impact of your product or your service. You know, um, Salvajidi has talked about traction or your finances. It is when you use technology as either, you know, even if you're for your innovation or disruption, but also managing and leveraging on it for the development and growth of your business or, or service um, that you would actually um, make the, the kind of transaction and attraction um, that you're looking for. So for me, the first and, and, and most important thing would be technology. Okay, thank you very much, Yemi. Um, because of time, um, I, I know that our audience has a lot of questions for us, but before we dive into those questions, I would like to hear from our two other panelists, uh, Ms. Madam Tony Adebiten, and of course, Fola Olatunji David standing in for Maya Organ. So I'm gonna go to you, uh, Tony, to, bring in some perspective. Most times when we speak about funding and, and, and attracting money, a lot of the money that comes in goes to uh, the FinTech and, and EduTech and all of those sort of uh, innovative startups. Uh, but we don't really get a lot of conversations from social impact uh, innovations. How can we change that narrative? How can we get our startups to be thinking more about social impact? How can we get more funding to social impact uh, startups? Thank you, Wale. Good to see everyone, Yami, and um, everyone else that's uh, on the panel. Uh, good, good morning, or oh, is it afternoon? Morning still. Uh, really good question. And um, let me first say that, um, you know, one of the key areas that we, again, need to think about, Yami talked about technology. The other piece is really looking at capacity building for all of our startups and, you know, and even, even later stage organizations, 
also need capacity building. So, so I think that's where, um, you know, so to kind of cross over to your question, you know, Wally, that with the fact that there's need for capacity building, there's also need for the investors to really kind of in, to, to come on on board to help these organizations to move through their journey. So one of the areas is, is around, you know, venture philanthropy and really venture philanthropy is, is very similar to venture capitalism where, you know, an investor really, in, you know, connects with an organization, um, provides some funding and that funding, instead of looking for a return uh, on their investment, they're looking for social impact as their return on investment. However, I'm also, you know, in, in, in Nigeria, it's very, or should I say in, in Africa, we're really kind of getting um, better to, you know, growing this ecosystem to be more buoyant. And, and so most people are really looking for a profitable return on investment. And that's what they're looking for. So when you go around saying social impact, people are like, you know, that's great, but I need to have a return on my investment. And what, what I can categorically say is that there are a lot of investors, uh, both from when you look at the continuum of funding from philanthropy all the way to uh, market, uh, capital market that have given so much to, to people on an individual basis. You've heard about black tax, tax and things like that. We all help, we all give and everybody gives and, and we ha have a um, opportunity to do that. But in terms of social impact, it's very difficult for people to really kind of turn their mind to social impact if they don't think about it as a strategic part of their vision and mission from the beginning. So that's one of the key things that I would like to say, um, all, you know, off the bat that really and truly um, the, the only way that investors will come to invest in, for social impact is if the entrepreneurs and also the organizations that are thinking about their vision and mission from the beginning incorporate it from, the, from, from that level of vision and mission. And, and capacity building is so key on that because uh, people like myself, you know, just to let you know, I'm, I am transitioning from ABPA and, and, and focusing more on helping organizations be investment ready. So I'm going to tap into the knowledge of my Ebon TD to, to help me learn more about POEM <laughs> so that I can really kind of, um, you know, strategically help um, other organizations as they're trying to really learn some of these things that even Babajide talked about uh, in terms of getting them structurally and, go and their governance ready. So all of those things start from the beginning. It's the foundation that has to be right from the beginning. Over to you, Wally. Thank you very much, Toy. Um, that's a very interesting perspective you've got. And I'm sure that Edmonti would be very happy to, to support you in making uh, you know, making you or helping you to achieve. So I'm going to go straight into the questions uh, box because I can see many hands are up already. So you can start to drop your questions in the chat box so that our panelists can start to provide, uh, you know, some answers to them. We have about 15 minutes uh, to wrap up this panel conversation. So it's time for all Sorry. So it's time for us to make this even more interactive. So you can start to put your questions in the comment box, uh, in the chat box, so that we can start to provide answers to them. Okay, so questions now. So while we're waiting for questions, um, I'm going to introduce one more panelist, uh, Tito Ovia. Tito Ovia, you're welcome. Uh, maybe you want to do a quick intro to, um, of yourself. And um, while we're waiting for the questions to come up. Tito. Oh, yes. Um, thank you so much for having me. My name is Tito Ovia. I'm the co-founder of a healthcare technology startup called Helium Health. Um, we focus on digitizing, um, you know, healthcare facilities with our mission as our company to be able to drive technology um, in the African healthcare sector um, and ensure that there's actionable data for all of the stakeholders across the value chain. Um, we provide products for providers, peers, and patients across that. So yeah, that's a little bit about me and Helium Health. All right, thank you very much. So I already have a question here. 
um, in the chat box. So I, I think me reading out the questions might be a more organized way rather than opening up everybody's mic. So I hope this is okay uh, for us to do my panelists. Okay, fantastic. So I have a question here from Teza Joseph. And the question is that Nigerians are new to startup. And most of them lack the knowledge of what the word means, SARS, and so where do they go for information uh, about what being a startup is? How do they get information about that as well? I'm gonna direct this question to you, Mr. Banky, because I think it is something that you can address very well. So over to you, Banky. Okay, first of all, uh, please don't always think of uh, our fees. Um, even me, sometimes I'm very scared. Uh, but there, there are many other ways. Honestly speaking, this is a classic example. This doesn't cost you anything. Um, last week, also do a, couple, a number of stuff. And if we see that people need to be educated around this, then that's not a problem. And I believe that um, TD, with his network, with Yemi Kerry, they do a lot uh, in this space almost for free. And so let's not always think of money first. Uh, let's think of that education, which Tony was talking about. Let's, we can build our capacity almost next to free. And if this is something that is also important, it's something that we can pull together at last week and deliver some kind of free webinar around it. So please, let's not think of, of EDC alone. If it is something that is required, it can be done. And I'm sure the uh, Lagos State government can do this easily. Okay, thank you very much, Mr. Bankoli. The next question, I'm going to direct straight to you, uh, Fola. The question is, do you, need local, um, do you need local investors for you to be able to attract international investors? And how do you go about attracting local investors? So that question is coming from uh, Innocent... Uh, it's coming from Innocent. Yes, so that was a direct message to me, but I'm putting it out there. So over to you, Fola. Hi, uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, happy to stand in for Maya today. Uh, she unfortunately couldn't be here. Um, so the question around local invest investors is, is, uh, is an important one. Um, I do think when you consider the fact that what an investor brings to you or what an investor should bring to you goes beyond just capital. Um, an investor will bring um, local knowledge and context, will bring relationships, will bring business development, will bring partnerships, will bring expertise um, to your business. Um, that said, um, there have been instances where the first capital some businesses have received have been foreign and they still succeeded. Uh, but what I will say is a foreign investor, while they bring capital and they bring some relationships outside, a foreign investor cannot help you if for example, your bike gets locked up in Ikeja police station, um, whereas your local investor will be able to you know, build a relationship. Um, but seriously, um, I think you, you want to think about it based on the type of business that you're building. Um, at some point, what you want to build is a business that attracts so much inbound that you can select who your investors are. And, and your local investors will always be um, a good sign that you're building something that is even accepted. Even a lot of the foreign investors will always ask you who has invested locally. Um, they want to know that you are not you know, taking them for a spin, that you have some uh, local skin in the game. In terms of where you can find local investors, I mean, this, this chat on, on this panel, there's a lot of people who write checks, um, Tommy Davies and a lot of angels like that, uh, the Lagos Angel Network. Um, but if you if you you know if you do a little research, there are firms such as Ingressive um, Capital, um, who I'm representing today, who write checks at the pre-seed stage, at the seed stage. What that really means is at the very early stage. Um, so you know, do some research. Um, if you literally search investors in Nigeria, you find a list of people. Um, but it's important that you find local investors. I think um, it's not the end of the world if you don't, but I think it's very important. Thank you very much, Fola. So, Banky, there's a direct question for you here. And the question is from Moses Ayenube, okay? The question is at what point as a founder uh, do you issue equity before fundraising or after? Uh, that's a very technical question though, for the people that uh, issue money. And honestly speaking, I would like to defer to either 
Yemi uh, Kerry. Uh, but let me just say that if it is me, I will first of all build traction. I will first of all show that I have, um, there is a value uh, because the more you're able to delay it and have traction and show more, then the better for you to be able to get a, a bigger value in, in that. But, but Yemi, it's, uh, you know, she does this for a living. So maybe Yemi may want to answer that. Yemi, over that, to you. That's my own. Um, well, there, there are a couple of things that um, us as investors look look at. Um, your value proposition is one. Um, what Banky has in, alluded to is another, which is that you have to show traction, traction being that um, there is a market for your product or your service. So it's not just that you're thinking about it in your head, but also that, you know, you have tried and tested it. And then we look at the addressable market. So even if you have um, attraction and selling to your local community and you take it from um, maybe Ikoyi and you go to Suleri and then there's no market for it, then it is of no interest because we're looking for those um, products or services that can have a larger impact on economy. Um, you are solving a particular problem that, you know, it's, it's, is not only within your community, but also can a, a product or service that can be replicable in other societies. So apart from that, we're looking at also what your team structure is like. Um, Toby talked, to, uh, talked about uh, conflict. That, that always breaks up a business. So we, we tend to want to understand how your team is structured, your governance, the impact you're making, the way we would exit as angel investors, because that's what we do. We, we invest in an area where there's high risk and a high reward. Um, but then, you know, if we find out that your business is just gonna die after about a year of investments, we would run away from you. So there are so many things that angel investors, um, our investors look out for. But the key of, about of, of, of all of this is the value and your value proposition and the kind of problem that you're solving, that it impacts um, a larger society. Thank and you very much. Don't mind me as the adding, uh, Wally. Please, that's where. Please go ahead, Toy. Yeah, that's where the the poem framework that TDA has developed really comes into play. Um, you know, in terms of how how do you get an organization investment ready? Um, you know, either for local investors or international. And I also know that EDC has a lot of um, uh, curriculum around um, investments and getting investment ready as well. So, so those, I mean, there's, there are a lot of um, tools out there. And I think, um, again, part of what we need to do more in our ecosystem is to streamline and bring some of these resources so that people can have an opportunity to, to be able to access them in a, you know, as much as possible in a one-stop shop, if there's, if that's possible, but that's a proposal that, that I'm um, putting on the table, you know, even for AOT 3.0 to look at in the future in terms of how, how do you uh, support this growing ecosystem and make sure that all the different touch points are available where people can access them. Back Absolutely. to you. Absolutely. Absolutely. So there's another question here from Teaser Joseph and his hand has been up. So one of the panelists needs to take this question. At what point does a startup need an investor? And what should the startup be looking out for? So we'll be kind enough to provide this insight um, for Tito, over to I, you. Yes, I, I think I'll, I'll take that. Um, um, having, of course, been in this position very recently. Um, so with our company, Helium Health, we really bootstrapped and you know for those that don't know it means that we actually funded the company in the first year or so ourselves um and that was because we really wanted to see whether this idea that we had and the concept we had of technology and healthcare facilities really did work and we wanted to be able to validate it with some traction first before truly getting investment to be able to grow and scale the company um, so we bootstrapped it ourselves, and not only did we do that, but we also applied to a lot of grants. So if you're an early stage company, um, don't always run to sort of funding for equity straight away or debts or anything like that. Again, there are a lot of instruments and there are a lot of, you know, sort of innovation challenges and things like that around. You just have to do a lot of research online in which you can use to be able to fund your startup in the very beginning. So 
do that. Use the money to be able to test the waters. And once you're sure that you have a minimum viable product, once you're sure that you have a clear strategy on as well how you want your company to grow. And of course, you also find different partners that you would like to be able to partner with and invest in you so that you can scale and grow your company even further. Then consider, um, of course, bring on investors um, to be able to have a, a bit of equity um, in your company. So everybody is different. There's no sort of clear time frame or anything like that. Some people bootstrap for years and then they raise investments from people straight from day one. But I would always say have a minimum viable product first, have some traction first so that you've proven your idea in the market. Thanks. Thank you very much, Tito, for that perspective, because the question, um, the follow up question is from Tuboso and is directed at you about your experience in fundraising or raising money outside of the country, uh, having raised money recently for your health uh, startup. Um, and I think um, Cosmos had a similar question about raising funds. So it, it looks like a, a good number of the participants here are really interested in knowing how do they really connect the opportunity. But from what the panelists are saying, it's clear that it's important that there is a lot of capacity you need to build before you start to look for uh, funding. So I think Tito's perspective helps, to, helps um, you to understand some of those things you need to be able to attract you know, uh, uh, international investment into your business. The next question is from uh, Diron. And Duran wants to know, and this question is directed at the director of the EDC, uh, about the knowledge-based information for startups from the universities. What is EDC doing to reach out to students interested in entrepreneurship from universities so that they can start to have information about how they can access funding and how they can prepare themselves to be the next um, um, African startup? Okay, thank you very much. Um, in the last uh, six, maybe seven years, we actually have been training students one full year on entrepreneurship. So you cannot go out of our university without having uh, a one year, you know, um, embellishment into, into entrepreneurship. Uh, you also must start and run a business on campus during that year, which you showcase at the end of uh, the second year. However, we're taking a tweak this year. We are actually moving from them just starting or creating a business to uh, looking for problems within their environment and then finding a solution to it. And that will then be demonstrated on what we call the demo day, uh, that solution. Uh, but much more than that, um, we have started a process where within the next 18 months or so, we're gonna put up a, an innovation center and, and some of the uh, people that I see here, I've already contacted some of them and they will be part of that mentoring system, um, that interaction between the town and gown. And um, in the next, I will say that 18 months, we will put up this and um, we are actually going beyond the university. So when I say finding solution, um, I'll give you one very simple one that we are about closing it. Um, one of the industry, industry players, uh, they, they have mini grids and they said, if you can look for a community within your axis, that if we put a mini grid there, the economic reality of that community, we can change it. And so for me, that's very interesting. Now, what we will do as academics is that we will take that mini grid, pull it there and say, what economic realities can we change? We're going to draw like 10 academic papers from it, how you use Minigrid to do this. So we will get our own uh, this thing from that. But more importantly, we will be able to then say to, let's say, Lagos State government and say, see, putting a Minigrid here alone will mean that um, whether it's, it's not vulcanizers, people that do very small stuff, SMEs, they will not have to worry about uh, generator and this and that. And the economic value of that small community will increase. We are, and then hopefully we introduce them to some kind of tax system the government gets from it. And we can show that just by putting this, it could even mean that they are a Greek uh, based economy. They can dry their products or they can uh, refrigerate it or whatever it is. Those are the kinds of things we are doing. And currently, we're working with the Nigeria University Commission, trying to develop EDCs across Nigeria to be able to do something similar. 
that we're doing. So yes, um, we, we, we are doing that. Last year, we did a challenge for students in the university and three of them that won, we brought them back this year during the um, Global Entrepreneurship Week. It's very interesting. One of them that came third, that was in um, Lasso. Actually, we gave him five, 500,000. He used that and he has, is now in five different states. And this guy is still in the uh, third year. He, he, he still have one more year to go. And he said to himself, there is no way I'm gonna look for job because what I'm earning today is he has 10 staff. He said in the next one year, he needs to expand it to 20. And what he's earning today is 20 times what he pays for his school fees in one month. That's do the mathematics. So we're already doing it, but it's gonna take a long while to make sure that everybody keys into it. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you for your response. The next question is directed at Yemi Kerry. Yemi, the question is around from Ali Abubakar, and he wants to understand, uh, do the conventional models for startups, uh, do they work? And um, for local investors, are the local investors in Nigeria accredited or do they have an organization? And what's that organization and how can you tap into it? uh if i if i understand the question right um you know uh, when 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 you go and you go and meet your cousin or your mom or your or your friend to borrow you money for a business and um and, and they give you that money there's no sort of framework or, or accreditation about that um what what is happening is i mean the, the culture has always been there with for us and Africa particularly, um, to be investors or, you know, and when people say friends, fools and family, that's the beginning of where you start to, to raise investments. Um, there, there is no accreditation. People are coming together collectively to invest. People are investing in individually. Um, people draw up investment philosophies. So I, I, we at Rising Tide, are a network of female entrepreneur, um, um, investors, mm -hmm. and that we're looking to invest into female-led, female-owned, gender-diverse management and team. And we look for technology and technology-enabled technology, technology -enabled businesses to, to, to invest in. Uh, that is our own investments philosophy. But for each, in the, in each investor, individually or network, they also have their preference of what, what their sector or the type of investments that they do. So really there's no accreditation um, um, for, for in, investors. Um, I don't know if there is um, globally, I know that there are some standards and, and um, there are some standards and laws and, and, and subsidies that are given to some things as people like angel investors in the more mature markets like the UK and, and Finland. Um, but right here in Nigeria, we don't we don't have any kind of accreditation. So what you have to do as a startup is to look for the type of network or investors or invest investor that is um, interested in whatever it is that your startup is doing. Okay, thank you very much, Jimmy. I mean, the questions just keep pouring, but unfortunately, our time is fast pens our next speaker is already online so we're going to have to wrap this up i'm going to give banky the opportunity to wrap this up i mean you started with uh setting the tone for this panel conversation you talked about the three level positioning you also mentioned some of the things that the startups themselves need to position or how they need to position themselves and what they need to look for to be able to attract the kind of investment they need for their business. Uh, so from all of the questions coming in, it's clear to me that there are many startups and there are many people thinking about how they can, um, how they can access funding and what kind of community they can be a part of. So to wrap this up, um, Banky, please, what would you uh, be, your, what would be your last words to help the startups and the participants here understand how best uh, they can get better access to investment for their business or their startups. Sorry, okay. but before yeah. you answer, please, Wally, can somebody put in the chat room the, the address of how you can contact EDC? 
because there's so many questions asking for that. Okay, Wale, well, maybe you can do that. Yeah, again. so uh, thank you very much. I mean, I put that in once, but for you to be able to get um, access to EDC, all you have to do is go to the EDC website. I'm going to put it in the chat box again. That's edc.edu.ng. Uh, that's www.edc.edu.ng. Once you visit that website, you'll be able to get access to EDC. EDC is in Lagos, in Abuja. Uh, we are also in Kano and, and in Kaduna. And we even have hubs in Ibadan and a few other areas in the Northeast and in the South South. So if you visit the website, you'll be able to get in touch with the EDC team and we'll be very happy to uh, have invite you over and listen to you and connect you with the appropriate uh, learning and opportunities that can help you grow. Back to you, Mr. Bankole. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Wale. Just, um, I will try and see if I can put this in, in uh, three broad statements. The first one is, I would like to see uh, a relationship development between the state and the players uh, in this space. So the likes of uh, Fola, Yemikeri, everybody that, that are either some kind of investors, uh, local investors, they should work together with Lagos State to be able to create a very viable ecosystem. So that if somebody is looking for something, they know that if I go to this position and I think somebody talked about a, a one-stop shop, I, I will find everything that I need there. So this is what I would like to see in Lagos, point number one. Point number two, is that there has to be a way in which people understand that even before you start your, uh, your startup, you need to build capacity. Once you have started, you need to continue to build capacity. And even when you are doing well, you need to build a different kind of capacity. And so at different stages of that journey, it's a lifelong learning because the kind of things you are going to need will vary. If you are already uh, in with the local investors, with the, with the seed uh, investors, when you want to go international, it's a different ball game. And people need to hold your hand, walk you through certain things. And so capacity building is very key. And then finally, I will say, um, while it is good to talk about uh, attracting investments and everything. Um, what Tito mentioned is, is something that is very dear to my heart. If you do not uh, demonstrate that you have a minimum viable product that you yourself, you can use to beat your chest and say, I'm okay with it. If you are not able to demonstrate traction, you see all these things about investment, investment, will just be like a joke. In fact, we have seen many businesses that have grown organically because they have something that is of value. But we're just saying that for, for, for rapid expansion, uh, you will need to have some kind of external funding. But whilst you are doing that, please remember that as they bring money or investment into the organization, you will be diluted. TD said it very seriously. So your mindset, don't imagine that you will forever be the majority uh, shareholder in your company. Sorry, it doesn't work like that. To the extent that you can even be booted out if you don't, if you don't deliver on the value that you promised. But it's all good because if you can deliver today, even if you are out, you can go and deliver another value. Thank you very much for having Fantastic. me. Fantastic. Thank you very but much, Mr. Bakker. Sorry, sorry. Yes. I was, yeah, I was in here because I need to address the first and second points that um okay so we'll happened. give you less uh, 30 seconds uh, because I'm being prompted because angel network has already started this creating the knowledge base um and also we are, have also started creating a platform where we're aggregating a lot of investors and the types of investments so that the, in, in the, the entrepreneurs can so we can yet yeah, therefore work with Lagos um, Lagos State to build on, on this um, um, That's what I wanted to check here. Awesome, awesome. All right, so I'm gonna follow uh, Isabella's 
uh, suit. And on behalf of the AOT 3.0, I want to say a big thank you to all the panelists. So I'm going to clap for you guys. I think you've done an amazing uh, job on this panel, and I'm sure that the participants and their testimony will be very awesome. So I'll be handing over back to you, Isabella, to take control of the mic. Thank you very much. Thank you very Thank much, you. Mr. Anifowoshi, our moderator, and all our esteemed uh, panelists. Some people have been at previous editions, so it's always good to see familiar faces. And also, having been through EDC, um, I know Mr. Anifowoshi, I know Mr. Bankole, so it's good to see uh, familiar faces from the gown. Um, it's always great when town and gown collaborate. So I'm still out of technology, Lagos 3.0. Next, we're moving to our keynote session. We had the first keynote session by Mr. Tommy Davis. And if you check the chat box, the feedback was amazing. And this next speaker is no stranger to Art of Technology Lagos. He's been there for all the editions. So I know that we're going to learn so much from him. I saw when he joined us and I know he's ready to deliver. But first we'll have an introductory video and then we'll go straight to our second keynote session. While we're waiting for the introductory video of our next speaker, um, a big welcome to everyone joining us um, here on Zoom. We also have people who are joining us across different um, streaming platforms on LinkedIn. We have almost 50 people, 46 people on Facebook, over 100 people, 115 on YouTube, 57 people. That's over 200 